What happens to us when we die? It is the eternal question that's rattled the brains of philosophers, thinkers, and clerics across every school of thought, faith, and denomination for millennia. And if you know the answer to it, you are either Keanu Reeves. I know that the ones who love us will miss us. Or you're probably a fan of Shadow Man. By that, I mean either the comic series or its 1999 video game adaptation. Not the shitty direct-to-video Steven Seagal movie. But, uh, I guess you guys know that. Because avid readers of Valiant's dark, gritty, anti-hero comic series are aware that every person's soul, without exception, ends up in dead side. The spiritual purgatory underworld where the true darkness at the heart of all things is made real. What we see in Death's Dominion is as void as a dead man's gaze, as cold as the light from a dying star. From the early 90s on, the Shadow Man comics, which revolve around a lineage of chosen voodoo warriors who can freely travel between the world of the living and the world of the dead, became one of Valiant's most prolific and successful flagship titles, quickly outselling even long-standing industry stalwarts from the big two, Marvel and DC, and serve as a central fixture for Valiant's shared universe. In its original run, the first Shadow Man series, with protagonist Jack Boniface, ran from 1992 to 1996 and sold over 5 million issues until Acclaim bought Valiant Comics in 1996. With their acquisition, writer Garth Ennis of Preacher fame renewed the series for its second run, in which the former zombie hitman Michael Lewis assumed the role of Shadow Man through his alliance with the centuries-old voodoo priestess Mama Netty. And this generation of comics would be the one that Acclaim adapted into the 1999 video game of the same name for the Nintendo 64, PlayStation, Dreamcast, and PC. In both theme and gameplay, Shadow Man turned out to be a non-linear, maze-like action adventure that put many a clever twist on a lot of common game design tropes of the time. It was an outstanding early 3D platformer, a surprisingly ahead of its time third person shooter, and a dizzyingly complex 3D Metroidvania that's incredibly satisfying to unravel, if you bring the patience. It's a dark and epic anti hero adventure based on a refreshing, underrepresented mythological backdrop in which we hunt down a cadre of sadistic serial killers through the underworld to save the world of the living and defy fate itself. Shadow Man is a game in which Jack the Ripper gets reincarnated in modern times, shouts FOR WE ARE MANY and commits seppuku within the first fucking minutes of the game. And as ridiculous as this may sound, it makes sense in context and it hooks you. So let me get this straight. The game cropped up in the fifth console generation, was ported by GOG in 2013 for PC and Mac, and recently got to bloom with a beautiful and faithful remaster by Night Dive Studios. A refurbishment of the original game rendered in a modern engine, bringing high resolutions, high-risk textures, sleek, modernized controls, and many other quality of life improvements, many of which are optional, can be enabled and disabled at any point of the game. And on top of that, it seamlessly restores a vast amount of missing content that was cut from the original game due to time and budget restraints. And the game comes with the first issue of Valiant's 2018 reboot of Shadow Man. All of which makes it arguably the most definitive and complete version of the game ever made. Now, before we start our nightly dive into the hopeless and convoluted maze of Dead Psy, for this video I approach both GOG and Night Dive, and I'm super happy to announce that within the first seven days of the release of this video, you will get an exclusive 30% discount on Shadow Man Remaster, the highest sale a game has ever been offered for on any platform so far. Just follow the affiliate link that popped up in the top right, which you'll also find in the description of this video, and snag them Dark Souls while they're hot. Where the Dark Souls are mine. Side, the world of the living, is at peril. One night, somewhere in New Orleans, the powerful, centuries-old voodoo priestess Mama Netty is haunted by unsettling prophetic dreams. 
her visions warn her of a group of devious serial killers from all over the world who banded together via the dark powers of Deadside, the world of the dead. Their exact goal and motives are yet unclear, but the omens are unmistakable. Something grand and evil, something truly cataclysmic is at work here, and it needs to be stopped. Luckily, Nettie has us, the Shadow Man, at her disposal. The one chosen warrior who can travel to Deadside and investigate these ghastly premonitions. So she dumps a massive ledger full of police intel on the killers on us and bids us to meet her in her hideout chapel hidden deep in the swamps of the Mississippi Bayou. Can't live, can't die. Deadside's the perfect good for me. A nowhere place. The asshole of the universe. Back when it was released, Shadow Man was the definition of a hot summer night's dream in a cartridge. So many people, just like myself, could not resist renting it from the local video store. It was one of the very few M-rated titles on the N64, and its cool package with the grim dark, sunglasses wearing protagonist pointing his grotesque firearm at the camera was just too tantalizing to pass up. It really was the time where tilting your gun sideways was the cool way only mustache-wearing square boomer cops would point a firearm upright during the late 90s. When I played this game for the first time, I distinctly remember, as someone who was already a bit familiar with the comics, being immediately struck by the game's presentation. This is a pitch-perfect adaptation of the comics it's based on, both in tone and atmosphere. Our protagonist, Michael Lua, is not some squeaky-clean, chest-puffing, do-gooder superhero idol. He's a disillusioned, undead voodoo slave who came into his otherworldly powers by being cheated into servitude by the powerful Caplata Mamanetti. And his role as Shadow Man, walker between worlds and protector of Liveside, is far more of a tormentious curse that was forced on him rather than a blessing of righteousness. Michael's been sick of it for a long time. I hate this shit. His connection to Deadside is his late brother Luke's teddy bear, a memento that will forever remind him of his brother's untimely demise for which he is partly responsible. And because Luke's soul is forever doomed to wander the underworld alone, his plushie serves as Michael's conduit through which he can freely traverse between the two worlds. Much of the story beats are narrated directly by the protagonist in voiceover monologues. As a god, I step forth upon the writhing, separating surface of the dead side serpent. The writing in this is oozing with the kind of pulpy purple prose you're used to from the kind of gritty adult graphic novel it's based on. And his portrayal positively thrives through voice actor Red Pepper's stellar dramatic delivery, making it feel like you're watching animated comic book panels with the words spelling out the text boxes that decorate the corners of the screen as you play. This is the dead side, the wasteland, the nothing beyond the bone-packed gates. Here Luke, my dear lost brother, wanders alone amidst the aimless ranks of those who cannot die. And hey, you could easily argue that by casting a black voice actor of Creole descent to impersonate Michael Lebois, a claim quietly nailed diversity casting in gaming way before it was a hot and ubiquitous topic in video game discourse. But what a great choice. Pepper brings a somber, dark and bassy trailer voice timber that delivers those off-narration beats to perfection, while making every instance when Michael gets sassy with one of his opponents, or even his comrades on the reg, into an extra savory treat. How could I refuse your offer? How could I ever refuse you, Agneta? You can't. I'm simply irresistible. This constant sass is something that's fun to witness for any newcomer to the setting, but it's an extra satisfying delight for those familiar with these characters and their personal dynamic through the backstory established in the graphic novels. Once we arrive in Deadside, we immediately land in a cesspool crawling with abominable zombies. We fight our way out of it and make our way to the gates of the underworld where we're greeted by Michael's old friend Jaunty, the foul-mouthed Irish top-hat-wearing guardian serpent of Deadside. Whatever, Mick, it's good to see you again. Seems like simply ages since I last set me eyes on your happy, smiling mug. The feeling's mutual. I won't elaborate on the absurdity behind Jaunty's gestalt here. He's really funny on his own, but read the comics if you're curious, it'll make more sense and you'll get some truly tragic backstory to further enhance your encounters with him during that game. 
From him, we learn that the monolithic industrial cathedral that's looming over this deprecated purgatorial wasteland has just recently cropped up, almost out of nowhere. Any idea what's going on in there? Nope, and I shan't be knocking on the front door to find out neither. All I'll say is, if there's something wicked heading this way, it'll be coming from in there. So we've got a work cut out for us. We stride into the maze-like catacombs, valleys, and canyons of Deadside to uncover a path to the dark cathedral that serves as our constant orientation point in the distance to investigate what's really going on here. Down here in the underworld, Michael is no longer of his mortal form, because in Deadside, the shadow mask in his chest begins to glow and pulsate as he assumes the role of his alter ego. I am the Lord of Deadside, shadow born at the confluence of worlds to walk between. He is stronger, faster, more agile. He doesn't need to breathe, and his firearm turns into the soul-stealing shadow gun, with which we defend ourselves against all kinds of evil abominations lurking in this putrid purgatory. Now, the Shadow Man, an immortal being who came into his powers through being betrayed, who reluctantly takes on the fight against the undead in order to challenge megalomaniacal villains that pursue a grand and evil scheme, and who on top of everything else replenishes his life force by vacuuming up the souls of his defeated enemies? If this made you think of Legacy of Kane's Soul Reaver, then I commend your taste. The parallels between these two games are so striking, both thematically and also mechanically, that they could easily be lost siblings. It definitely begs the question if one game did not serve as inspiration for the other in some way, but having been released mere months apart from each other, it really is one of those strange cases of incidental pairing in media. Just like in Soul Reaver, which I've also covered on this channel before by the way, Shadow Man's Underworld is a labyrinthine, three-dimensional metroidvania that gradually opens up more paths and areas as you collect new and ever more powerful skills and abilities. It's also one of the best examples of early 3D platforming, all neatly wrapped in an open-ended, character- and story-driven action-adventure. And maybe more so than in any other game of the era, the mind-twisting, maze-like qualities of Shadow Man's Dead Side Overworld are probably one of the secretly most important aspects of what makes this game so fascinating, grotesque, and once it grips you, addictive. See, there's a lot to discover and a lot to overlook in these dark, meandering corridors. Endlessly twisting paths, crevices, tunnels, and hallways, dizzyingly branching canyons, caves, temples, and serpentines are the fabric from which Dead Side is woven. Getting lost here is as guaranteed as the sun rising in the east each morning. Well, Kate doesn't do that down here, but it's, it's just a metaphor, right? My point is, you're gonna get lost. Period. A little while ago, I was browsing through game stores when I stumbled across the Bard's Tale remaster from 2018. The original was a huge entry drug into RPGs for me, which is why I've toyed with the idea of giving the remaster a try for a while, for nostalgia's sake. I skimmed a couple of user reviews when this line here took me unexpectedly off guard. Listing as a pro for the remaster is the quality of life improvement, specifically mentioning the addition of an auto map. Now, for anyone who has no clue what I'm babbling about here, the classic Bard's Tale from 1985 was a hugely influential early grid-based first-person dungeon crawler, also sometimes referred to as a gridder. Back in those days of the early wizardry, dragon quest, or in this case Bard's Tale games, due to old hardware with just 64 kilobytes of memory, or even 48 if it played in a humble ZX Spectrum, an automatically updating map was simply not yet a feature that was feasible in RPGs. So for pretty much everyone who played those games back in the day, the memory of having a graph paper notepad and pencil next to you to manually cartograph the dungeons while crawling through them was a central part of the experience. Now, I absolutely get and respect how auto-mapping these days is considered a necessary convenience feature for a remaster, but I've always considered the act of charting the dungeons you traverse a big and to some degrees even integral part of the appeal of these games. Having the map fill itself out automatically in the remaster left me weirdly disappointed. The reason I went on this tangent was because this reminded me of how Shadow Man's, if I can use Zelda terminology here, overworld, dungeons, and palaces are structured, and what the developers consider an engaging challenge for the player. In the beginning phase of the game, Michael is weak. His limited abilities and tool set prevent him from reaching or entering many places that are clearly, theoretically accessible, but currently just out of reach or sealed off. 
teasing future progression that awaits us over the course of the game. In the distance lies the dark, towering behemoth of the asylum, and our first task is to actually find a way to it through the maze of Deadside, because we quickly discover the path is not so straightforward. The pathways, valleys, and caverns of Deadside twist and branch in ways that throw off our sense of direction. Navigating this labyrinth with neither map nor compounds is a challenge that many people entering it may not be prepared for, especially when rushing in blindly and expecting contemporary design conventions to spoon feed players. There is no spoon. Admittedly, back when I played the ported version that came out on GOG back in 2013, its confusing overworld did throw me off. But also, I admit that back then I approached this game with a completely wrong mindset. I craved fast and instantaneous nostalgic gratification and brought neither enough patience nor the will to meet the game on its own terms. The expectations with which we approach a game are often the deciding factor between enjoying it and being thrown off like an amateur at rodeo. Nowadays, when a game does not prevent players from getting lost for too long through its design, it's considered a fail state. Video games are commonly expected to make you feel like you are very smart, figuring it all out on your own while the game systems are actually nudging you in the right direction all the time, ideally without you even noticing. Which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that approach, it takes a shitload of skill, patience, experience and dedication to handle that well. But back in ye olden days, a convoluted, open-ended overworld that you were guaranteed to get lost in was literally something that would be printed on the back of the box as a selling point. Not that different from how every single Dark Souls entry and its many derivatives proudly herald how much you will die in this game as a key marketing point. Because yeah, if you know what you're getting into, getting utterly lost, but not giving in until you eventually start successfully untangling the Gordian knot a game puts in front of you can be immensely cerebrally stimulating and satisfying unlike anything else. The beginning hours, when nearly every door mechanism and branching path is sealed off or placed just out of reach, it felt frustrating and disheartening, daring me to just throw in the towel and give up. But Shadow Man really is one of those examples of games that get good if you stick with it for more than the average playtime. Because the more I got into it, the more it clicked, and the more I got hooked, eventually to the point of near obsession. I couldn't stop thinking about it and haven't played a game that I wasn't able to put down like this in a good while. One aspect that strongly contributes to this is the way in which Shadow Man employs the act of collecting stuff. Not just as a tacked on, extrinsically motivating mechanic, but as a central gameplay element that is linked to the game's progression and moves the narrative forward. Throughout Deadside, we regularly encounter large gates with symbols that correspond to our radial health and magic energy meter. The amount of symbols highlighted on these soul gates indicates how much soul power we need to harness before we can burst it open. And to increase our soul power, we have to collect Dark Souls, which we can find hidden all over both Dead Side and Life Side. Oftentimes, they're placed in tricky to reach key locations or placed beneath some obstruction or skill gate that requires additional powers to overcome. And if we collect enough souls, the circular magic bar increases one notch. Michael will exclaim that The power of the Dark Souls, I embrace it. And from that point on, we have access to soul gates one level higher, as well as more power for our shadow gun, plus our mana pool also increases for the use of magical items and weapons. So story progression, skill progression, and open world traversal progression are all interconnected. Aside from that, we regularly find Kado scattered all across the game world. Many of them are in plain sight and right on your path, while others are hidden more intricately in places that encourage you to really scavenge every nook and cranny which you will automatically adapt to doing over time. Because these Kado pretty much work like the hard pieces in Zelda games, only that you need a lot more. Instead of four, like in Zelda games, you have to collect a total of 100 Kado and then offer them at the altars of the Temple of Life, which increases Michael's life energy by one additional slot. Oh generous Loa, a spiritual trade for life beyond. This is, of course, completely optional. You can choose to ignore the Kado completely, but by giving you a very real and powerful payoff, and by constantly having you pick up enough of them to trigger the compulsion to look for more, complete the next set of 100, it automatically nudges players to adapt exactly the kind of situational awareness and collecting fever that's required to untangle this convoluted mess. 
And with each new ability, item or soul level you unlock, you suddenly recall a plethora of doors, pathways and previously barred passages you had to pass on before, and you feel compelled to backtrack, luckily with a generous transportation feature, and check them out now that they're in reach. It's an immensely rewarding and invigorating cycle. A wonderful example for this is how lava and lava pits serve as instant death barriers and roadblocks for large parts of the game. Lava and fire makes traversal challenging and many places completely unreachable. But then you eventually acquire powerful, uh, bioluminescent voodoo tattoos that gradually render you more immune to fire. First they allow you to touch fire, then you learn to walk on lava and eventually you'll be able to dive into the forbidden hot tubs in good old Metroid Varia suit fashion. And once you unlock one of these abilities, your brain goes into hyperdrive, remembering the many places across Deadside and the Asylum that were covered by lava before. And you just can't wait to traverse it all over again, more powerful than ever, in your hunt to uncover every corner of the underworld. Rinse, repeat, it's really neat. This is to me by far the best way of making backtracking in a video game exciting. Classic Metroidvania level design. The more you unlock, the more you learn the lay of the land like the back of your hand, which in turn makes you feel more and more powerful and knowledgeable about the place you're exploring. Like the drive to uncover everything, and this is me coming full circle with my Bart sale tangent from earlier, eventually got me to pull out my physical notebook and pencil to start jotting down every single spot in the game world I came across that I couldn't reach yet using crude mnemonic instructions that helped refresh my memory several hours down the line because drawing an actual map of this termite colony? Forget it. Ah, see another spot that I might be able to climb once I acquire the ability to scale waterfalls of blood. Another thing that makes an initially inaccessible and janky experience like this gradually work in the player's favor is that Shadow Man is a formidable example of a good early 3D platformer. I often bickered in the past about how platforming and the first major generation of 3D gaming put so many design challenges on the table that a lot of developers were outclassed by. I replayed and made a video on Majora's Mask last year and I had a great time with this pensive, out of line N64 classic, but oh boy did I not enjoy virtually every passage in the game that relied on three-dimensional platforming skills. There are many other beloved games of that era that relied on 3D platforming whose solutions, in my humble opinion, for navigating a three-dimensional space have aged like fine milk. Which makes them unforgivingly hard to unconditionally enjoy if you didn't play them back in the day and lastingly conditioned your muscle memory. Shadow Man to me is one of the best examples for strikingly good 3D platforming from that console generation. The camera is never a hindrance. Level design always gives you a great sense of scale and distance to intuit where to go, which jumps and obstacles are within your reach and which ones you don't even need to bother with. Michael's movement patterns are always predictable enough to maneuver him intuitively and accurately. You'll rarely make a mistake that you'll blame on poor motoric systems and lacking environmental signposting. Granted, the improved and modernized input system provided by Night Dive's remaster unquestionably played a big role in it. But the biggest reason why Shadowman's platforming segments aged so well compared to many of its contemporaries is, first and foremost, smart level and game design by people who brought great amounts of experience to the table. Multiple key members, for instance, previously worked on probably one of the best early 3D platformers in history, the original Tomb Raider by Core Design from 1996. This expertise can be thoroughly felt in Shadowman. The team's experience, bundled with their fiery passion for the dark graphic novel inspired setting, made this gem a timelessly tight, fast and engaging open world action adventure. Now if you feel like I've been talking about this game for a very long time already without actually going deeper into the story, then that is, incidentally, pretty similar to how Shadow Man leads players through its story as well. Because not just mechanically, but narratively, Shadow Man doesn't spoon feed its story to the players in neat, bite sized chunks either. Instead, it almost force feeds you a large chunk of information up front that you're unable to fully make sense of, at first. 
Mamanetti shares her prophetic vision and leaves us with both a large ledger of police intel on all five serial killers that are somehow connected to the supposedly impending end of the world, as well as a lengthy tome of prophecy that serves as a clever manual in disguise, as well as a cryptic piece of further exposition. Because at the beginning of the game we don't know nearly enough to make sense of it all, which is why our only option at this point is to follow in the path that the prophecy foretells. Even if, as we can see when we skip ahead a few pages, it doesn't exactly instill a lot of confidence. There's a lot of info being dumped on us, which we can devour all in one go, or leave parts of it untouched until we feel like we need it. We still won't be able to see the bigger picture until way later. All we know at this point is that somehow, the Five share a connection via Deadside and the Cathedral of Pain plays a central role in the unfolding events. But how and why they're doing this, and by what means they came into Deadside in the first place, because mortals are usually unable to enter it, is completely unclear at this point. And so we meander and fight our way through Deadside, till we uncover a path into the hulking industrial complex of the Asylum, which alone takes multiple hours of playtime, and from there we continue roaming about its various sublocations. The factory floors and catacombs of this complex are equally as convoluted and brain-twistingly arranged as Deadside, but aesthetically and architecturally they're more grungy, rusty, artificial and machine-like. Just like in Deadside, we find many branching paths that are restricted because we lack the necessary tools or abilities to pass through. Many parts, for instance, are sealed off by fire and lava, so our trek through the asylum, in which we collect other important upgrades like Dark Souls, that can in turn open up new areas back in Deadside, will regularly lead us back to dig deeper into the temples and grottos of Deadside, where in turn we'll salvage more things required to venture further into the asylum again. And so we keep oscillating back and forth between them like a metronome, always progressing a little further each time. Eventually, we gain access to the Asylum's tram system and reach the Cathedral of Pain at the heart of it. It houses five heavily guarded altars, each one dedicated to one of the serial killers we're supposed to hunt down. But it appears to be a dead end at first. The altars contain little worship chambers and a towering ramp leading up to an impaled corpse at the top. But there's nothing we can do with it, really. So we search around a little, and in a nearby chapel room we find schematics hinting towards a strange contraption made from these impaled corpses and how they're somehow linked to the serial killer's life-side locations. And even though we can always return to Mama Netti and Jaunty to chat about our progress, most of it we really have to find out on our own by good old private investigation. I've thought long and hard about how much information of the grand design of the villains in this game to disclose in this video, and I came to the conclusion that I'm going to avoid spoiling too much of it, so that people who have never played Shadow Man or have never gotten far can experience the intense rush of epiphany that comes with it on their own. This style of storytelling is something I've always found incredibly fascinating and satisfying. In a way, it reminds me of the timeless appeal of Scion games like Myst, Riven, or Abduction, in which you're thrown into a foreign world that feels like it's existed and functioned under its own rules long before the player stepped into it. Places where you're littered with initially unconnected information that you gradually have to process, tapping in the dark with question marks hovering over your head for a long time. So you patiently start connecting the dots until eventually things start falling into place in a sudden avalanche of enlightenment. I call this phenomenon cerebral orgasm in the past, and I'm still quite fond of that term. I'm not sure if Shadow Man's epiphany scale is on par with the intense brain eruption of a riven or abduction, but it's genuinely satisfying to gradually decipher where those mysterious retractors are hidden across the various outliers of the asylum and in what perverted and grisly fashion they operate as conduits between the worlds to uncover how the serial killers are connected to the master plan of Legion, the main antagonist, to subjugate the world of the living and, to tie the bow, how entering the Five's real-world location and defeating them will help you on your quest. The beauty of it is, as I said before, how the discovery part of Shadow Man is intricately tied to its underlying collectathon world design. There are not just the Dark Souls 
and Kado to collect, but several ancient voodoo temples to find, puzzle and fight through in which we harness the powers that make us increasingly impervious to fire, there are many artifacts to excavate which we can wield in each hand individually to adapt and improve our fighting styles and movesets, and finally we find this gigantic machine core at the center of the asylum with its pistons perpetually pumping, and we have to find out how the five and their life-side locations across the world are connected with this. Which we have to do in order to stop the machine and follow the spectra apparition of Michael's brother Luke that keeps pulling him deeper and deeper into the heart of the asylum. Shadow Man has so much cool shit to throw at the player, but it's never afraid of withholding it for a long time to keep the game continuously engaging. For example, a narrative hook like, you are going to hunt a group of sadistic, psychopathic, misogynistic serial killers is something that I expect any story to let the players relish as early as possible. I took them all to my heart. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, Mary Kelly. And loved them. Truly loved them all. But in Shadow Man, it took me over half the duration of the actual game until I A. knew where I could find them, B. had everything I needed to actually enter their worlds, C. understood why I was fighting them for the progression of the game, D. understood why I was narratively fighting them aside from they are evil, and E. Make it night in their dead side locations, which turns out to be required to take them on in the first place, as we find out eventually. You're gonna understand it when you get there. This credit of trust in the player's attention span has the effect that the time I'm finally coming for them. I've been edged to the border of madness and anticipation. I'm ready! I'm ready! I'm ready! I'm ready! I'm ready! I'm ready! I'm Shadow Man is truly one of those games that the further you get into it, the more it sucks you in. The horror, the horror, I embrace it. Now, as always, we're getting to that bit of my videos. You know the drill. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Shadow Man, a fifth generation console classic, nowadays is an abandoned and neglected relic of the video game industry that is virtually unattainable through legal means. The only valid way to hop on your Hispaniola and play it is through emulation. Wait a minute, no that's not. Huh, would you look at that. Shadow Man is for once available on modern platforms. The 2013 port of the original on GOG and Night Dives Remaster on Steam and GOG, as well as planned to be released on PS4, Xbox One, and Switch in the near future. Sorry, force of habit. I've covered so many classic and forlorn games in the past that it's almost hard to believe that Shadow Man, for once, is not yet another example of a classic video game that's been long out of print and that's these days only available via used games resellers and emulation. Instead, Shadow Man was pristinely refurbished by Night Dive Studios. They truly deserve credit here, because this is how video game preservation should be done. This remastered version of the game kept intact the entire skeleton and every bit of flesh on it that's still palatable and replanted it into Night Dive's in-house Kex engine, making it run smoothly and seamlessly on many different platforms. It's the same engine, by the way, that had powered the fantastic remaster of Blood, which I've also covered on this channel before, as well as the just recently released remaster of the original Quake. This replanting of the original source code enhances the game's visual fidelity with super high resolutions up to 4K and beyond, optional shader effects such as anti-aliasing, motion blur and high quality lighting, as well as faithfully overhauled high quality textures to smooth it all out, which can also be turned on and off at will by the way. The absolute and quite massive dollop of cream on top of it all is that Night Dive, in close collaboration with the original developers, faithfully restored multiple areas of the game and seamlessly reintegrated them alongside a shed load of additional cut content, including weapons, cutscenes, dialogues, and a lot more. All of these were firmly planned to be included in the original release, but Acclaim was forced to drop a lot of content last minute due to budget and time restrictions near the end of the production. Aside from several areas in Deadside that were scrapped from the original release, Acclaim also had to reluctantly drop two of the serial killer's live-side locations, namely the Salvage Yard in the Mojave Desert, where we find Marco Cruz, the flamboyant repo man and disco killer, and meet him in his unexpectedly surreal showdown on a nausea-inducing dance floor. Yeah! 
as well as the summer camp in Florida, hideout of Milton Pike, the bulky Vietnam veteran video nasty killer. In the OG release, these stages were replaced by moving those two bosses into the same maximum security prison as Victor Vitrakian, the Hannibal Lecter lookalike whose stage is central and final of the five. The pathways to their life side locations were also open from the get-go, whereas in the remaster you had to find additional retractors and various side locations of the asylum scattered across Dead Side to pry open each of the five conduits rib cages in the Cathedral of Pain to pay the killers a visit. Yuck. Shadowman Remaster reintegrates these stages and many more features and goodies so seamlessly that I didn't even notice that something was altered without reading up on it. Though, in my defense, it's been a while since I last played it. I honestly wish that this approach was the standard for video game preservation, and not the abysmal state it's been in due to copyright hoarding mega corporations slumbering on incredible IPs like a dragon on their pile of looted gold, doing everything in their power to prevent consumers from showing too much interest in their historic backlog in favor of all the shiny new releases that make the big dough instead. See, whenever I showcase a great classic game, a chorus of voices inexorably erupts and screams for a remake. And yeah, in some cases, a full-on remake can be exactly the thing an old title needs. But honestly, in so many cases, I feel like a remake is not really what's needed. Like, the game is right there, and it's still brilliant in all its classic splendor, and it doesn't need to be regurgitated and pasteurized for every complacent game design trend audiences have been conditioned with over the past decades. More often than not, what is needed is a well-adapted port, or in some cases, and the longer it's been out, a faithful remaster that leaves everything that hasn't gone past the expiration date untouched. A spiritual trade for life beyond. <sighs> and yeah, this is exactly what Night Dive's been laser focusing on over the past decade. See, I spend a lot of time with emulators to play beloved classics from older console generations, and emulators allow you to embellish these games rendering fidelity on modern systems reliably, and Shadow Man Remastered feels like immediately skipping ahead to the finish line of a long and arduous emulation and tweaking procedure. This is ultimately why I'm so smitten with remasters like this one. Flawlessly working and enhanced visual fidelity straight out of the box and with a lot of additional goodies on top that don't dilute but enhance the original experience. Night Dive wrapped the game in a state-of-the-art engine, providing it with silky smooth modernized controls and other quality of life improvements. Any new player who approaches it for the first time will find their path into the game's zone to be so much more straightforward than if they have to get accustomed with a more unintuitive, deprecated control scheme they didn't grow up with. Like, try playing any PS1 first-person shooter and you know what I mean by that. And for anyone who doesn't like all the new and additional schnick-schnack, most of the added or modernized features can be turned on and off at your leisure, including the modernized controls. And for hyper-purists, well, the original GOG port is also still out there, and it won't ever go away due to the DRM-free nature of GOG's offline installers being already out there. You're never going to be able to flush that from internet memory anymore. <laughs> And if that's still not pure enough for you, there's always emulation. Weapon in my hand, my hand, the arcing death blow at the end of all things. The horror, the horror, I embrace it. So there is a Shadow Man for all of us. Shadow Man Remaster was really the breath of fresh air that I needed to get thoroughly obsessed with the universe again. Couldn't put down a game until I had 100%ed it, and that is someone who's not 100%er at all. And now I'm having a blast reading through the comics again, so that's awesome. In this video, I hope I could convey what I loved so much about it, and if that made you feel like you want to give it a try, as I mentioned before, the game is available for the first 7 days after the launch of this video over on GOG.com for 30% off if you follow the affiliate link I've provided in the description. If you're sadly too late for the snap deal, hey, using the link to buy it still helps me out a little bit because I get a tiny commission for that. So that's really lovely, I think. Now, for anyone who discovered me through this video, hey, I'm Ragnar, and on this channel I cover old games, horror games, indie games, or combinations thereof, and try bringing attention to titles that have fallen into obscurity, as well as outstanding indie games that I want people to not miss out on. I usually showcase an indie game in this credit segment here, but there sadly wasn't enough time this time around but I'm planning to bring games from Underground back. 
my series on exclusively indie games, so that's hopefully gonna make up for it. So stay tuned. Making these videos and the financial support of everyone who partakes in making them is primarily crowdfunded, so if you'd like to help us out, you can easily do that with a monthly donation within your comfort levels over on my Patreon. The support makes a tremendous difference, it is the de facto financial backbone of this channel, so my sincere gratitude for considering and to anyone who supports me there already. And here is a special shout out for these lovely, generous supporters. Agustin Ortega, Nineball9606, Laird Wackala, Lawrence E. Buben, Terry Collins, Serena Abramson, Kyle Lee, Isabella Stoner, Bradley Douglas, Faulty Gear, Kevin H. Yang, Ronan Crom, aka Daniel242172, Giselle Almonte, Neil Snowden, Kenan Ward, Space Admiral Vivi, Ian Rhodes, Catherine Escobar, Raul Blanco, Samantha, Vincent Cavanaugh, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Casper Rahm, The Spiral Architect, Tara Flops, Billy Lott, Shannon Blue, David Zelenak, Boris Bugling, Federico Rocha, Lillenby, Refkins, Dylan Labonte, Tabby, Chris Chan, Cordelia Crescendo, Puka Princess, Gary George, Matt Gretton, Thwagam, Cory Marr, Max Macula, Thomas Brunner, Christine Monastère, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Chris Z, Chuck Taylor, Jin Hansen, Nikot the Brave, Dana Rosa, Kelly Michelle Russell, Morgan K, Hippo Hobbly, and Baruga Dono. Until next time, ta ta! Oh, God, no!